I'd like to introduce our two authors. David Goldsmith is the author of On Solid Ground, Why the Earth Isn't as Controversial as You May Think, a presentation of the solid evidence for knowledge about the Earth in the face of scientific illiteracy, literal readings of religious texts, whimsical contrarianism, like the Flat Earth S Society, and deliberate misinformation, like the arguments against climate change promoted by big oil. David received his bachelor's in geology from Colgate here in upstate New York and his PhD at Harvard, where he studied with the late Stephen Jay Gould, who is thanked in his acknowledgments. We had Stephen Jay Gould when he was alive uh, back uh, a couple of decades ago. He's director of the University of Al Albany Honors Co College, University of Albany Honors College, which is one of the great success stories of this university. Though he joined our community only about a year ago, he has helped make the Honors College even better. Among his greatest achievements, from my own biased perspective, is a much stronger partnership with the New York State Writers Institute. We've collaborated on several events over the past year. It's a dream come true for us to fill many of our venues with Honors College students, and we're very thankful to David for that and to any Honors students who may be in the room. So a round of applause for David. Sarah Girigosian is co-editor with Virginia Conchon of Marbles on the Floor, How to Assemble a Book of Poems, an anthology of essays by poets in all stages of their careers that explore the art and technique of poetry manuscript assembly. She's the author of the poetry collections Queer Fish, winner of the American Poetry Journal Book Prize and The Death Spiral. A PhD graduate of the UAlbany English Department, she teaches in the Writing and Critical Inquiry Program and the English Department. She's also a valued collaborator on a number of Writers Institute events. She served as host and moderator for conversations with poets Elizabeth Alexander and Randall Horton. We're extremely grateful that she's brought her classes many times to our events. Round of applause, please, for Sarah. So, each author will spend about 15 minutes at the podium, followed by a conversation with all of you. It's a pleasure to welcome our friends and colleagues, Sarah Girigosian and David Goldsmith. So Sarah first. Thank you so much, Mark, for that introduction. It's such a pleasure to be among friends and colleagues and to have such a warm audience. Um, thank you also to uh, the English Department uh, Creative Writing Program and to the Writers Institute as well as the Honors Program. I'm so excited to be in conversation with David Goldsmith today and I have an amateur, in influ um, amateur interest in geology so I'm looking forward to talking with you more. So um, I only have 15 minutes so I'm, I'm going to be um, pretty quick. Um, and I'll be talking about Marbles on the Floor, which um, uh, went to press with the University of Akron um, back in February. Um, so it's been out for a couple of months. Um, Virginia and I um, conceived of this book as an opportunity to begin to theorize the process of assembling the poetry manuscripts, which is, um, even in the poetry communities, is fairly under-theorized. There are a number of contributors who are, are anthology, both um, early career and late career poets, including the Pulitzer Prize winning poet Diane Seuss and um, a SUNY alum, Kazim Ali, who I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, so yeah, some of the initiating questions that animated our um, anthology were, how do we begin to conceptualize the sequencing of the poetry manuscripts? And how do we begin to um, consider the, the comp complex ecosystem of the poetry collection? In many ways, the process of assembling the poetry manuscripts is an intuitive process. And we were interested in making that process legible for early career and uh, late career poets as well. Um, so there are 12 contributors. And I'm, I'm just going to talk about a few of the contributors um, essays. First though, I, I need to pay homage to Emily Dickinson, who I think is both like fairy godmother and talisman to this collection. Um, 
Our uh, title for um, our collection came from Dickinson's I Felt a Cleaving in My Mind. And we also noticed that um, her work was repeatedly um, referenced throughout the collection. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about um, Pulitzer Prize winning poet Diane Seuss, uh, her contribution to this anthology. Um, so there are multiple threads of inquiry in her essay, um, including themes of um, binding and identity making and unbinding as a kind of reckoning with the alterity of the self. Um, one thing that she says is that our poetry manuscript is realized in uh, the eyes of the objective other, that is the, um, the reader to whom we're reaching toward in our anthology. Um, you might recognize on the left, uh, Emily Dickinson's herbarium. Um, so uh, Seuss was also interested in tracing the, uh, the young poet's um, curation of the herbarium. Um, and what she noticed is that often these flowers were arranged both aesthetically and pragmatically, not necessarily scientifically. Um, and that, that same attitude of um, you know, interest in aesthetic possibility and um, pragmatic uh, kind of needs for the manuscript were something that she was working through too in her own essay. So it's a collage essay, and one thing she says in the collage, which I think is really kind of exciting, is that her essay is one that you could take apart, cut it with dull scissors, section it from um, section from section like a horsetail weed, reconstitute it in a different order, stab it, and bind it anew. In this way, I've wanted to enact the thesis in my structure. Although I have been apparently personal here, I have been selective. I have not told everything. I have left out the really gruesome parts and have kept only that which might serve the argument. This is what we do in poems, in books, in all works of art. The omissions shape the work as much as the presences. I hope you, you poet, have taken away from this experiment that order is birthright as is disorder. And in some ways that might seem counterintuitive. What do we mean by disorder? Um, but I think disorder uh, and order are mutually embedded for Seuss. Um, disorder can mean that kind of production, productive um, tension between intuition and craft. Um, I think Seuss is also uh, you know, uh, referencing Marianne Moore as well. Um, omissions are not accidents and so sometimes both she and other contributors mentioned that there's often some sort of secret embedded in a poetry manuscript, which um, I think is, is really kind of evocative. And um, it means that there's perhaps a kind of holding back as well within the poetry manuscript. Um, and I just, I love this quote. Uh, Sue says, in writing and ordering your poems, you are forging a self, housing it in a stall of your own making. You are building a bearable myth. You are constructing as much in your process as your product some fragment of the everlasting. So for her, uh, the, the process of putting together a poetry manuscript is tied not just to craft and technique, it's also a process of identity making, a process of reckoning with your origins as a poet um, and with your legacy. And as I said earlier, um, you know, I think my own anthology would not have been realized without that objective other that Seuss mentions before. Um, as she writes, there is no greater provocation to risk than to be taken seriously, to write not for someone, but toward someone, a someone she calls this objective other. So um, to young poets out there, I would, I would say, um, think about what feedback you've received from your reader or readers. Um, how might that feedback inform the poems that you wish to reach a larger audience? Um, and as I say to my, my own students, um, it's a good idea to study your own favorite poets, where have they published, what journals and presses look appealing. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but I also just wanted to highlight Christopher Salerno's contribution to the anthology. Um, I actually worked with uh, Chris on um, the manuscript I'm currently working on, and um, he's an amazing editor. Um, he had me engaged in really, I guess I would call them meta-discursive exercises, writing about the process of writing my poetry manuscripts. Um, you know, as you can see from these, these questions, he was getting me to think about how other readers would see the manuscript. So, um, you know, I remember writing a blurb for the manuscripts, writing my own review for the manuscripts. Um, 
thinking about those poems that were my strongest, my A-game poems, and those that were my B-game poems, as he called them. And um, you know, ultimately, in the end, you want to keep your A-game poems. And there are so many ways to arrange a poetry manuscript. I mean, it doesn't just come down to theme or a line of inquiry. It can be color. It can be image. It can be um, point of view. Uh, it can be um, time or location, right? There are infinite possibilities for organizing a poetry manuscript. And I, I also just wanted to highlight Elise Knorr's contribution in which she really emphasizes um, getting physical with the poetry manuscripts. Um, so that means printing out your poems, arranging them on the floor, even just throwing them down the, um, the stairs if need be. Um, and in other words, just being open to really wild juxtapositions um, and kind of a wild associ associative logic as well. So um, the poetry manuscripts, I think, can have this tension between order and disorder, again, to use the words of Diane Seuss. Um, so anyone recognize the left hand side of the screen? <laughs> so um, I love, I just had to sh uh, give a shout out to Kazim Ali's essay in the anthology because of course he's a Sunni alum and he calls Sunni um, the mother of his wisdom. And this is a really perambulating essay and he writes about traveling through France um, and coming into his own as a poet, embracing discontinuity and fracture in poetry. Um, but he also writes about being a college kid and exploring the tunnels with his friends. And um, it's just a really lively uh, essay, one that I wanted to share with you. Um, and then lastly, uh, the last essay of the collection is one by Victoria Chang. Um, you probably have heard of her collection, Obit, which has received a lot of positive attention. Um, she says that caring for uh, the bonsai or ca caring for an ailing mother like her own um, was very much like the process of putting a poetry manuscript together. Um, as she says, let the poems tell you what works for them, knowing each season may be different. Each time of day may bring about a different order. The rain or winds can affect order. In other words, um, be open to the shifting landscape of your own moods. Um, sometime you might come to a poetry manuscript with a different mood than you did the day before. And um, that might open up new switchbacks and alleyways and thought um, in terms of ordering the poetry manuscripts. Uh, there's no um, one method of approach for organizing the poetry manuscript. So I'll save questions for later, but thank you so much for listening. No, that's, that's, that's okay, yeah, and then we'll... Okay, sorry about that. That's fine. Or should I have it over here? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming this afternoon, and I'd like to thank the New York State Writers Institute for inviting me for this conversation. I'm looking forward to it for quite a while. Uh, my name is Dave Goldsmith. I'm the director of the Honors College here at UAlbany. Uh, my book is called On Solid Ground, Why the Earth Isn't as Controversial as You May Think. And it's entirely possible that you're coming in here thinking it's not controversial at all. Um, Pluto is supposed to be the controversial planet. Um, but I've, I've been teaching geology a long time and I noticed a pattern not too long ago. Uh, and that is that the really big, like, fundamental discoveries in geology, I'm not talking about, like, the minutia of mineral classification or things like that, but, like, big things like it's round, it's old, it goes around the sun, are exactly the things that people do argue about when it comes to the Earth. And these are things that geologists have, have known pretty well. I, I say in the book at one point, nobody discovered the Earth is round. You know, it's like asking who discovered the moon. Like, anybody who, who thought to look could, could notice this. And yet we've been arguing about a lot of these things for a long time, and it really made me wonder why. So the central question of this book is why do people believe what they do about the Earth? And, and as a result, it sort of sits at this nexus in between two big questions. It, it sits right in between what do we know, but, but also how do we think? Um, the, the point of the book, I mean, it's not a geology textbook. Like, it's, it's not meant to be used in an intro geology class or anything like that. 
Um, it teaches what we know about the earth and how we know it, and, and the, the questions that are in it are specifically chosen, again, because people argue about them. And the way it conveys this information is by telling the stories about the people who made geologic discoveries and the occasional naysayer, um, be, because I really do believe that science, first and foremost, is a human endeavor. Um, and it uses the science of geology and its history to explore the traps that people fall into when thinking about complex subjects in general, and geology in particular. So, so each chapter chooses one of these basic facts about the Earth, like Earth is round, uh, tells the story of how geologists have come to know that fact, describes various points in the history of geology where people have resisted or fought back against these new ideas, and then explores how scientific discovery can be challenged by just basic human nature. And I'll give you an example. It's the one I mentioned just a minute ago. Many of you probably remember about 15, <laughs> 20 years ago, astronomers informed us Pluto is no longer a planet. And they had very, very good reasons for doing this. It turns out there's thousands of objects about Pluto's size at the edge of the solar system. If you call one a planet, you really have to call the, all of them planets, and, and that's unwieldy and, and, and untenable. So, so we reclassified Pluto. Some people call it a dwarf planet. Some people call it a trans-Neptunian object. Uh, my favorite name for it is it's a Pluto-like object. <laughs> um, but people got mad. People wrote letters to the editor. People carried signs. This is a t-shirt you can order online. Pluto, never forget. Let's keep in mind, all of, this, all of this brouhaha was about an object that at the time, that thing on the right is the best picture we had of it. <laughs> nobody loved Pluto. No, no, nobody really had skin in this game. The problem was scientists were telling you something now that contradicted what your fourth grade teacher told you. And it's really hard for people to shift gears about facts and science. We, we like to think, you know, the, sort, sort of the standard, you know, the, the, the standard story of science is that discoveries come from new knowledge or new information or new methods. And sometimes that's really true. Um, the, the person on the left is, is one of the people I mentioned in the book, Pierre Bouger. He's a um, French mathematician and geologist who worked in Ecuador in the 1730s. And he worked right at the foot of Mount Chimborazo, uh, which is the highest peak in Ecuador. And, and, and actually, kind of a fun fact, because the Earth bulges at the equator, uh, the top of Chimborazo is actually the highest point on Earth, um, it, or the furthest point from the center of the Earth. Um, Bouger noticed something that, for my money, is one of the coolest facts in all of geology. If you are standing near a really large mountain and you drop an object, it doesn't fall straight down. It falls down and towards the mountain. And the reason for that is kind of mind blowing. It's because mountains are so big they have gravity. So down, when you're near a mountain, down isn't down. Now, first of all, that's just mind blowing by itself that mountains are actually that big. But this actually led to a series of discoveries that made some things possible we didn't even think we could do. This was actually the first step in weighing the Earth. You know, Earth is big, you can't just put it on a scale. You know, we have no idea what's inside it. We haven't been more than about a mile beneath the surface, or at least in 1730 we didn't know what was inside it. But when you drop that object and it falls slightly away from down, the angle it falls at is determined by the ratio of the Earth's mass and the mountain's mass. And if you've got a good survey map and you know how much rock weighs, you can figure out how much the mountain weighs. So you can actually weigh the Earth just by dropping objects near mountains. That's really cool. That's an example of a really small little discovery that sort of sets us on this whole new path of, of, of understanding. That's not always how science works, though. Uh, guy on the left is Isaac Newton. Newton in the Principia gave us the rules of motion, sort of unified standard and celestial mechanics, but he also created these things he called the rules of reasoning. He said, this is how you do science. You must follow this particular method. And one of the things he very famously said, uh, he said it in Latin, hypotheses non fingo, translates roughly to, I don't make any hypotheses. He very firmly believed scientists had no business interpreting data. The job of a scientist is to observe the world 
Note what you see. If the things you see happen to fall on a straight line, figure out the equation for that line. But interpretation, asking why, was completely beyond the realm of science for Darwin. Uh, sorry, for, for Newton. You had no business inserting your own personal biases. So the picture on the right is, is one of the more famous pictures in the history of science. It's Darwin's first notebook where he first sketches out an evolutionary tree. The tree is pretty radical. What's more radical are the words above it, I think. Darwin started with an idea and looked for data to support it. And a lot of his really early critics all said the same thing. It's not Newtonian, so it's not science. The idea that you could be scientific and correct and non-Newtonian took about, really about 30 years after this was sketched out. It's one of the reasons Darwin sat on the publication of The Origin of Species for over 20 years, is at the time it just wouldn't have been considered science. We had to really think differently about how we look at the world to make this discovery. It wasn't based really on any new observations or new data. Most often science comes about because there's a combination of these two phenomena. A uh, gentleman on the left is a Japanese seismologist named Kaiyu Wadati, who made a, a discovery in the 1920s. He lived in Japan, lots of earthquakes in Japan. He noticed the pattern that the further inland you go, the deeper the earthquakes are happening. Person on the right is Marie Tharp. Tharp worked for the US Navy after World War II. Um, she, um, because she was a woman just after World War II, she wasn't actually allowed on the boats. She worked with the data that the boats brought back and realized that a, f a few things about the bottom of the ocean, these were, these were voyages to measure the depth of the ocean, and realized, A, there's a big mountain range running down the middle of the Atlantic, but B, it's got a valley in the middle because it's actually being pulled apart. Most of 20th century geology is just putting these two observations together. The realization that if the ocean floor is being pulled apart in one place and something is sinking under the continent somewhere else, that the whole crust is in constant motion. The people who hated this idea the most, this idea that would eventually become plate tectonics, geologists. This is, um, this is R.T. Chamberlain, a, a geologist from the University of Chicago. When he first heard the idea of chunks of the crust moving laterally across the planet, he said, if we are to believe this hypothesis, we must forget everything which has been learned in the past 70 years and start all over again. It's a terrible reason to reject a scientific hypothesis. But it's one of the reasons that the theory of plate tectonics really, really got off the ground it, only in the 1970s. The problem is, it's also how a lot of people think. Whether you're Chamberlain or whether you're Darwin's Newtonian critics, it's a really powerful argument for a lot of people to say, we've always done it this way. What you're proposing is new, new is bad. You know, it, it's a logical fallacy called the argument from tradition. And, and the world is full of these logical fallacies and, and people making mistakes in the way they think. The interesting thing about the history of geology is that sometimes, you know, mistaken thinking has some help. Um, as, as Mark alluded to, like, like most books, my book has some villains in it. Uh, one, one of them, this is, this is probably my favorite character in the book. This is, this is Samuel Burley Rowbottom. Um, Rowbottom spent the 1800s moving back and forth between a couple of different careers. Um, he designed railway cars that turned out to be physically impossible to build. He ran a utopian socialist commune on the banks of the Bedford Canal. Um, right before he died, he tried to enter the, the booming soft drink market unsuccessfully. But, but his most profitable endeavor was actually geology. Uh, Rowbottom managed to convince an awful lot of people that because the canal that ran through his commune looked flat, it was flat, and therefore so was the surface of the earth. Now, now why did he do this? Um, it, it, it was, you know, this is going to sound like a strange motive for geology, but it was for the money. Um, Rowbottom used to sell out theaters uh, with people coming to hear him explain his model. He called it Zetetic Astronomy. Uh, uh, Zetetic means f you know, based on inquiry. Um, he, would, he, he made so much um, 
selling out these lecture halls, he actually franchised. He sold other people his right, the rights to give his lectures. They, in turn, sold other people the rights to give, them the, to give these lectures. Uh, I like to describe Rellbotham as a man who took a spherical planet, compressed it into a disk, and then used that to build a pyramid scheme. <laughs> um, one thing to point out on, the, on this flyer for one of his talks, at the bottom, he actually used to offer a 500 pound reward for anybody who could prove the Earth is round. As you might imagine, a lot of scientists saw this as an opportunity for easy money. Um, however, anytime somebody came along and, and gave a measurement that showed the Earth was round, as by the way people have been doing for about 2,000 years, Rellbotham and his followers had the same explanation. Now, your instrument is broken, or your observation is flawed, or your model is off. Anything that showed the Earth was flat had to be flawed in some, I'm sorry, anything that showed the Earth was round had to be flawed in some way, because everybody already knew the Earth was flat. Uh, ironically, this is called circular argument. <laughs> and, and circular argument and argument from tradition are just a few of the dozens and dozens of logical fallacies that uh, philosophers and logicians have pointed out, really going all the way back to Aristotle. Some of them you know from day-to-day -day life, wishful thinking. Uh, is a logical fallacy. Wishful thinking, the flip side of that is appeal to consequence. That's where you say, well, if this is true, then that is true, and that would be awful. So this can't be true. Um, very, very often, these logical fallacies are just a part of the way we think. We're in a weird position as a species. To the best that we know, we are the only species that actually goes out and tries to discover things about the universe. But we're also the only species that denies the things that we find. <laughs> And again, sometimes that's just because thinking, you know, thinking can be challenging. There are a lot of ways to, for, for, for logic to go awry. Un unfortunately, sometimes it has help from people who are engaged really in, in just dishonest discourse. So I, I would say the lessons from On Solid Ground, and, and these are both for the reader, but also things that I, I think I learned a little bit better as I was writing this. You know, all of geology starts from one thing, wondering about the world around you. Um, but be persuadable by new ideas. Be aware of your biases and, and what you might bring into an inquiry. And most importantly, just engage honestly with other people. Thank you. I'd like to talk about uh, the journey of writing a book, and, and is that a good metaphor? Um, sometimes the roads are straight, sometimes they're winding, there are ups and downs and obstacles along the way. Deer dart out in front of your <laughs> car. Were you mistaken about the destination? Was the journey as valuable or more valuable? than the arrival, those kinds of questions. So who'd ever like to uh, answer, answer that first? Yeah, I mean, the process is definitely valuable. Um, I, I'm a co-editor of this anthology. Um, so I was learning from uh, mid and late career poets who are you know, far more established than I am. Uh, it was an honor that they trusted their work with me. Um, you know, for, for me, being an editor, you know, it's part pedagogical, but um, I also formed some great relationships through the process of uh, working on this anthology. Um, a number of these contributors are, they're going to be lifetime friends now. So um, yes, it's challenging. Editing is uh, definitely a labor of love, um, but I, I learned so much through the process and um, I would, yeah, I would recommend it to those who have an interest in editing. Um, for me, it was definitely a journey. Um, I would probably describe that journey as sort of like, you know, almost like planning, a, more, more like planning a trip. It's one of those things where you, where you see a place and you say, oh, you know, I should really go there one of these days. Um, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, a lot of this came out of um, conversations I've had with students, conversations I've had with colleagues. And, and just, um, really interesting where some of the chapters came from. 
um, when, when, when I started writing the book, I knew I wanted to talk about young earth creationism and climate change and flat earthers. Um, but every so often I'd be describing the book to somebody and they'd say, you know, oh, are, are, you, are you gonna include the UFOs that come from the middle of the planet? <laughs> I, I had never heard of hollow earth theory before I started this oh. book. But fun, fun, <laughs> hollow earth. Hollow earth. And, and, and what, what I learned about it, you know, that, that was the best part, was learning new things. Ho Hollow Earth really starts off with, with a really respectable scientist. I feel kind of bad. Edmund Halley, who like, discovered comets and, and realized that, that a lot of astronomy was predictable, had really bad luck when it came to geology. He, he, he dabbled a couple of times, and, and one of his first was a Hollow Earth model. He thought um, the Aurora Borealis was heat escaping from, from cracks near the, uh, near the North Pole. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was the best part of the journey for me, was A, the planning of it, but then B, the little side trips that, 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 that came up. So both of you um, in, in your uh, books uh, I, I express an intention to to transcend um, the, uh, in, in some ways, the uh, subjects of, of, of the books. Uh, David, you, you talked about this in, in your presentation. Um, this isn't just right a, a book about geology. It's a book on making good arguments about the findings of geology um, in, in order to uh, present those arguments at the at the Thanksgiving table but but also just how to make a solid argument right um, how, how to uh, make a strong rational evidence-based argument in general and um, Sarah you, you, in the introduction um, it's mentioned that uh, this isn't just about uh, necessarily about constructing a poetry manuscript, that there are uh, insights, right, um, about how to bring a book into being, about uh, how to uh, assemble a book more generally that is more than the sum of its parts. Um, so I, I was wondering, you know, just how much that mission is in the foreground, how much that was a discovery, or, or whether you, you kind of knew all along that your books um, potentially had a, had a wider, a wider purpose. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, just a, a, a preface. I'm one of those people that always comes around to talking about Elizabeth Bishop, who's um, my favorite poet. But um, you know, when I was listening to David speak, I was thinking a lot about how your book is in many ways metacognitive, it's thinking about thinking, thinking about arguments. And I think that um, the, you know, Bishop herself was very interested in geology. Um, in fact, she was interested in Darwin because of the ways that he uh, promulgated a new theory. Um, he started with empiricism, um, you know, careful note taking. Um, she lineated Darwin's work um, turn them into lines, um, and she was interested in geopoetics, um, which was a term inaugurated by Harry Hess. Um, you know, he said that in order to um, imagine this geological phenomenon, we have to open ourselves to imaginative possibility that is akin to thinking like a poet. And um, I'm bringing that up as an analog for, I think, how you know, a lot of the contributors conceive of manuscripts assembly, um, being open to imaginative possibility, but also being anchored in um, and craft at the same time, or being anchored in, in close observation, being open to possibility. Um, so yeah, this is a book that I think, uh, you know, it, it's very valuable to the poet, but um, I can imagine creative nonfiction writers and fiction writers picking up this book or anyone who's interested in thinking about thinking, thinking about sequencing, and finding some value in the book. Yeah. Um, can, can you hear me now all right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm, 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 I'm a little thrown because I didn't know that Harry Hess had originated the term geopolitics. 
So <laughs> Harry Hess is one of those people who spent the 20th century trying to figure out where the ocean floor was going. Yeah. So um, I, I, I just think that is very interesting. I wrote a paper on Elizabeth Bishop's geopoetics, so <laughs> it's something I'm very excited about. <laughs> um, in, in terms of the metacognitive aspect of, of, of my book, one of the things that one of the things that got me thinking that way was realizing that very often scientists and non-scientists are almost speaking a different language with the same words. Um, and, and how often words can get in the way of conveying an idea in science. Um, probably the, the best example is scientists and non-scientists use words like fact and theory in completely different ways. Um, a, a lot of people are under the impression that someday with enough observation, a theory will become a fact. Like, you know, that there will be a ceremony of some sort and we'll, we'll decide that, that, that evolutionary theory is now evolutionary fact. But, but that's, not that's not at all how it works. I mean, in, in science, a fact is an observation and, and a theory is an explanation for your observations. You know, something can be a fact and a theory at the same time. Things fall down, except near mountains. You know, why is the theory of gravity? That it does is the fact of gravity. And this just keeps coming up over and over again. Um, another example that I talked a little bit about in the book is a lot of people, when you say the word fluid, hear the word liquid. And as a result, a lot of people assume that the center of the, the interior of the Earth is, is, is liquid like water. Um, it, it's a fluid solid, and people find that some sort of like weird, you know, Contradiction, but no, it's it, it's like silly putty. Um, you know, it 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 is you know undeniably solid, but flows on long time periods. So so that's sort of where I started getting into the whole idea of of, of how we think about the Earth, um, and and it just sort of snowballed from there. I'm, I'm going to ask one more question, and I'm going to unless unless Jill, you are very insistent, and you would like to. <laughs> Okay, a follow-up, yes. It has to do with the notion of poetic thinking. Sure. And so I'm wondering, you're specifically talking about fallacies, and this is why people misunderstand scientific theories, but then you pop in with the, with the hollow earth, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a much more beautiful idea. That's the reality. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I can you know, hear that that's funny, but I guess I'm wondering if it's not so much that people are not sure what a fact is as opposed to a theory, and they're not necessarily making a fallacy, they're just choosing the more beautiful idea. We, I'm just we, wondering if that might be why people think the Earth might be hollow. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there is definitely an aesthetic quality to a lot of these fallacies. Um, and, and in fact, uh, what, one, of the, one of the figures I talk about in the book, uh, is, is Francis Bacon, who, who, who wrote Novum Organum in the 1620s, and sort, sort of laid out what he's considered to be the big categories of ways that we think badly. Um, and, and one of them is, you know, a, a preference for storytelling, a, you know, a, a sort of a narrative fallacy. Um, I, I agree, Hollow Earth is a really, is, is a really pretty idea, and, and it, it sh a, a lot of it, I don't know how I want to say this. Okay, it it shows up in some unexpected places. Um, hollow earthers often believe that there are holes at the poles where where heat comes through, and as you might imagine, in the early late 19th, early 20th century, during sort of the golden age of polar exploration, hollow earthers had sort of a a, a comeback. Um, and there was an assumption early in the 20th century that maybe the poles are warm. Which is why, at about the same time, people started arguing that Santa Claus lives there. Mm -hmm. The entire idea that Santa Claus lives at the North Pole comes out of Hollow Earth theory. <laughs> so it's it, it's a great example of sort of like intersection of of, of science fallacy and 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 poetic thinking. So one one more for me, and then I'm going to turn it over to all, all of you. Uh, poetry and geology are fields that you love. Um, they are not funding priorities in the, <laughs> in the society at large uh, at, in, uh, for the university system. How do you deal with that? <laughs> it's not a loaded question. 
<laughs> and if that's a bad or painful no. question, I, I, I can retract it too. Um, I, I, I didn't get into geology for, for, for the money and the power. Um, I, I got into it exactly because I love it. Um, it's, it's what people, it, it's what scientists have done since the pre-Socratics. I mean, the first scientists really were the Euclideans and, 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 and the, the early geometers, at least in, in, the, in the Western tradition. They, you know, they were doing it because they were studying perfect, beautiful things. Um, all science originally has its origins in people trying to get to you know, that, that platonic ideal plane in some way, shape, or form. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try not to get on a soapbox, but I think more than anything, what, what this generation, uh, this moment needs um, is, um, yeah, is poetry, is uh, thinking about aesthetics, thinking about questions of um, writing to persuade, writing to express oneself. Um, uh, my students, I can say, are, are hungry for it. Uh, they're hungry for um, creative writing classes. They're hungry to write. And they may not even know that at the beginning of the semester, but it's something that they discover for themselves um, when they start to tell their own stories. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not doing it for the money either. I'm doing it because it's something I genuinely, uh, genuinely en enjoy and believe in its potency. Yeah. Also, also, one big problem that geology has is most people don't learn it. 9% um, of Americans have taken a geology class, have taken a class on how the earth works. And, and I think that's particularly appalling when you remember that 100% of Americans live on earth. Um, I, I myself was counseled away from it. I was told in ninth grade, don't take geology. That's for the kids too dumb to take biology. Yeah. Yeah, uh, um, and, and one of the great joys I've had teaching geology, and, and especially teaching it in, in gen ed classes, is people who have never thought about this stuff before just suddenly realizing how amazing it is. So, so uh, just, uh, just because, a round of applause for keeping these flames alive. <laughs> uh, and now, now we'll take some questions. Yes. Oh, I, I believe, um, Sarah, sorry. Um, you said that uh, you're talking about how to uh, instruct a poetry collection that it can reflect someone's like identity or character. I was curious what you meant exactly like that. Do they like structure so that any poems or themes that are more important to the author at certain points or mm. other stuff? Like yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, one thing I noticed across this anthology is that poets were not just writing about technique or craft. They were writing about coming into their own poetic origins, the process of becoming a poet. Um, all of these poets spent years and years working on their first collection, um, making sure it was ready for publication. And writing about that process, um, like learning their blind spots, learning um, how they could become, um, you know, more like their own mentors, right, that they looked up to. Um, so I think there's that aspect. A lot of these poets are, are reckoning with their own poetic identities. Um, but also, I mean, a piece of advice I got um, that I really value is that um, when you're putting together a poetry manuscript, the opening section um, should it have some kind of pedagogical value to the reader? It's an opportunity to teach your reader how to read you. Um, and so that might mean introducing your own mythos or introducing your own kind of, um, you know, what is of value to you as a poet. Um, you can do that through your speakers. You can do that through the images that you create. Um, but there's a kind of uh, teaching that happens in the first section of the poetry manuscript. Oh. Um, when you, during your process, your writing process, was it more difficult to actually go out and find the research or was it more difficult to tie all the research together for both speakers? 
question? I think I probably had more problems with the research than with the tying the research together. And, and in my case, I think I actually did it a little bit backwards because for, from years and years of teaching geology and also history of science, like I knew the, a lot of these stories, but I didn't know the details or, or I didn't know how I knew these stories. So actually being able to back up what I was saying in some of the chapters was actually one of the more difficult uh, parts of the process for me. Um, and when it comes to marbles on the floor, I would say that it, um, it came about because there was a discursive gap. Um, you know, there, there's only one anthology, to my knowledge, about ordering the poetry manuscript, and that is Ordering the Storm. And so um, Virginia, Conchin, and I uh, conceived of this book because we had a, a conversation about the fact that this was an aspect of craft that had really gone under the radar. Um, you know, there are some blog posts out there, but um, we, we wanted to see a more formal apparatus come into being for poet practitioners to think about sequencing their poetry manuscripts. Can, I ask a, uh, can you talk a little bit about the sizes of poetry manuscripts a little bit? Because I was actually thinking about one thing when you were talking about that. The full book length like manuscript, how long is that? Mm -hmm. About how many pages are people looking sure. at? chat book? Do you have any reservations about how, and that brings in the publishers, mm -hmm. why those lengths are set? Because mm -hmm. they're not aesthetic, they're actually technical, they have more to do with yeah. publishing. So talk about... Yeah, I mean, um, for young poets out there, I would definitely say read the guidelines carefully before you submit anything to a journal or a press, because it, it will vary with uh, presses. Generally, poetry collections can be anywhere between 60 to 100 pages. Chat books are smaller books. Uh, they're usually tightly um, united by a theme or some kind of inquiry. Um, and they tend to only be about 40 pages. So some poets get their start by um, writing a chat book first. Or like my, my friend was saying that you know she's working on a full length manuscript, but she had a reader um, tell her that there was a chat book within the book. The book wasn't ready yet, but there was a chat book in the book, which she published. So, um, I mean, there are all sorts of ways to get started, but um, yeah, getting kind of familiarized with the conventions of what's being published in the, the poetry world um, is going to help you inordin inordinately if you are a young poet yourself. So, uh, so Sarah, you, you mentioned how this book helped kind of widen your circle and, and build a, a community of, of friends, and, and to, to what extent is a book about building a community, um, e even even if it's a community that you will never meet in, in, in person. And, and I, 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 I have a, a, sen a very strong sense of the Albany poetry community. We have Dan Wilcox here, um, who is uh, <laughs> certainly a source of energy in the, in the local poetry community. Uh, um, but uh, I, I'd like to throw that question maybe first at, at David. Um, is, is there a geology community? If there are folks in the audience who would like to be belong to a geology <laughs> community, what would they do? Where would they go? Um, and, and who would they speak to? Uh, to become part of the local Albany geology community? Pardon? Part of my watch, I apologize. Oh. <laughs> um, there's actually a really strong upstate New York paleontology community. One, one of the leading paleontological, well, one of the leading paleontological research institutions in America is the Paleontological Research Institution, which is uh, <laughs> which, is, which is located in uh, in uh, Warrensburg. Um, it, it's a great place to get started. It's where the Museum of the Earth is. Um, that, that's, that's probably your best local access to the geological community. Uh, I would also just say, you know, if, if, if you want to meet other geologists, um, you know, there, there are Facebook groups for upstate geology. Um, this is a really, really old part of the North American continent. Um, so, you know, when, when we're talking about the fossils around here, I mean, you know, you, you have new, you know, younger things like mammoths, but, but mostly you're talking about rock that's 400, 500 million years old, and, and, and that's, that's, you know, the top of the stack. Um, there, there's rocks in the Adirondacks going back billions of years. So this, is, this is a great place to learn geology. That's so cool. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I would say that, um, I mean, this in this room are members of a poetry community that is absolutely vital, from my students to my mentors uh, to colleagues. Um, coming out to events like this is, is the best way to meet um, other practicing writers. Um, it, it really begins at poetry readings, book talks. Um, that's where you find your community.